So, good morning, everybody. Hello. Hey, everybody's leaving, hey. <laughs> Usually it starts in the middle, you know. <laughs> when I had my first database course at university, we started with a group at 110 people, and at the end there were six left. I was sitting there, but I was afraid to get off, you know, because if there are only six people left, they will recognize you, you know. <laughs> so <it's> like <clears throat> my first impression was, who needs this stuff? And this is how I ended up, you know. So, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Hans. Uh, Hans is easier, so just forget the rest. Uh, so, this is Postgres performance in five minutes, so thank you, everybody, for showing up. So, it's 200 people, which is, I think, more than Silicon Valley Conference, so that's quite an achievement. So, thank you for the organizers, and thank you for having me here. Excellent. <laughs> Belgium was 50, just to give you a comparison. So, who are we? Next slide, maybe? Yeah, we are working on it. No. 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 That is bad news, but... Maybe we could work something out. So, as you know, we do Postgres support, but we're not especially into uh, tick, uh, clicker support. Does anybody have a nice idea how this works? No? Nope. I think so. What does it mean? So, uh, it's actually infrared, so you've got to point it at ah. that receiver. So that doesn't match. Nope. <laughs> nope. I don't know. Does spacebar work? Hmm? Or does so this is why I always should have more people in support, because one peop person might not make it, you know? This, no, this is Lloyd's. Lloyd? Yeah, that's what we tried. Oh, yeah. Um, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we work it out, no problem. Can you use the keyboard? Uh, no. Maybe, yes, no. How can we do that? I don't see the... Me not either. Why is this a Windows machine? Yeah. What? That's what's wrong. Yeah, it's, it's a bug. I've seen it. Ah, works, works, works. So. This is us. Uh, we are a worldwide Postgres company. We've done this kind of stuff for, for 20 years. We've got a couple of offices uh, around the world, and we hope to add some more. Uh, also, what we do is basically a lot of Postgres, data mining, business intelligence, all this kind of stuff. So in short, all you have to remember is we're great, right? That's <laughs> what it is. So we've got a couple of customers around the world, which includes Lufthansa, BMW, some people you might not know. Hims is actually, you might be interested, they are selling Viagra, right? So um, in case you are interested, uh, just uh, tell me privately, there's no need to raise your hands, you know? Um, so let me give you some inspiration uh, for, this, uh, for this talk here. And there was an enlightening moment. I was in Germany. You know this country, Germany? Ever heard of it? Yeah, and this was really nice. They had a, a nice uh, warehouse, right? It's uh, uh, exo, exo, exo stuff, exadata, and they had a nice little table with 400, uh, 340 billions of rows, which was basically the entire history of the company. You know, every time something broke, every time something got fixed, all this kind of stuff. And um, this uh, Oracle thing, this exadata, uh, hit its limits, right? And they did a lot of wonderful, awesome stuff, such as Countstar were not in 8 billion rows. So, and they had 22 queries, which they identified as a problem, and they looked at it and they said, why do you keep counting the whole history of the company every day, right? It doesn't change much. Stuff from the 60s is pretty constant, right? <laughs> and nobody knew. <laughs> So they were thinking about investing something like 5 million into some exadata hardware, and they had 22 queries, and nobody even had a clue what the thing was doing and why they ran it. And this was wonderful inspiration. 
for this presentation here. So why does Oracle die if you throw a stupid query counting hundreds of billions of rows? How can it happen, you know? So let's, let's approach it from, uh, from, uh, from a more abstract point of view, a guideline to failure. And this is international, right? So it has nothing to do with country, it has nothing to do with origin, age, or anything. This is a universal law which you got to follow if you really want to achieve perfect failure, right? And uh, a perfect failure would be you take your 300 billion rows and you join them 14 times. No wonder it fails. You do no pre-aggregation. And the most important thing is you must not know what your queries are doing. That's really important. So you really have to run stuff. You have to complain about it on a regular basis, but you must not have any idea what it means. That's the biggest pre-requirement to failure. Run stuff you don't know. Right? Stop thinking, right? I'm telling you as a Postgres consultant, we get rich with this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so please stay as stupid as you can potentially be, right? It's awesome, you know? Wonderful. So these shoes were paid by one of those missing indexes, you know? <laughs> uh, so what we got here is on small data sets, and the, the question is what is small? Could be five gigabytes of data, could be 100,000 rows, so whatever you consider as small, hardware has been so great recently that it's gonna bail you out. So if you have small data sets, you, you can do basically what you want. This is not advice, this is observation, okay? So <laughs> on a small data set, you can basically do what you want. But at some point, your data is gonna grow, and this is why stupid stuff is gonna kill you, right? If you are counting people in the room, you can do that easily, but if you start counting people in China, it's gonna take a while, you know? But it's still the same query, right? And one very important observation, and we hear that all the time on the phone, can you tune my Postgres conference? And they already know that they're doing something stupid, right? <laughs> there is no such thing as a magic parameter which says performance on. If performance on would exist, guess the default value. <laughs> it would be off just, you know, to dodge you. Know? There is no such thing as performance on, doesn't exist. So the solution in most cases is not in your Postgres configurations. It's a simple rule, sheet in, sheet out, right? <laughs> so if you stick to this rule, you, you're surely gonna fail, right? So next thing is hallucinations. Who has hallucinations, anybody? Oh, you, yeah. How many people do you see? <laughs> okay, so uh, people, when, when something goes wrong, first of all, it has to be the file system, it has to be the hardware, it has to be the configuration, and everything is slow. It's not, I press this button and this thing is slow, but the, the, the observation is usually everything is slow, right? Who has heard that before? Yeah, everything is slow, not just this stuff, everything, right? So the first thing you have to do is to pinpoint your uh, problem, and what you usually get is, we need a bigger server, we need more disk, we need more RAM, right? Or more RAND, depends on. And uh, th th that's not gonna fix anything. So the first thing is, in order to figure anything out, and this is universal, this is not just for Postgres, this is for everything, is the first thing is, please measure. You can sit on a stone and meditate, and it's gonna to come to you naturally, right? It's not gonna happen. In database stuff, what you want is to measure, right? And there is one thing. The answer is not in your load graph. The answer is in your queries. You can keep plotting graphs to infinity. It's like if you have a fever and you put your temperature on the wall. It's not gonna change anything, right? You still feel sick. You're still dead, and in order to fix it, you put a second graph on the second wall, right? It's not gonna change anything, right? You wanna figure out you got an infection, you got cancer, you got whatever you, you might have, right? But it's not the graph which has the solution, it's, it's the disease, you know? And in database work, the eternal truth is that queries cause load. So why does everybody look at the load graph? <laughs> look at the bloody queries. And in uh, Postgres, there is a thing, it's called PGStat statements, and in my judgment, it's the gold standard for analysis, because it's really gonna tell you what's going on. You're looking for the root cause. In many cases, it's, it's, a, it's a small thing, you know? And uh, here is what we got. 
in uh, pgstat statements, we can, we can see the query, how often it was called, and how much time it took. And guess what? If you order by time, you will get the most time-consuming stuff on top. How cool is that? So it's not the load graph anymore. It really points down to a couple of queries. So you could see this query is going to run 50 million times. This query is going to do this and that. It's slow. It's whatever. Also, you see minimum execution time, maximum execution time, average execution time. And then you also see the number of rows. If you run a query which returns 50 million rows 10 million times, it's a hell amount of rows. But if you press a button on the website and the database has to return 10 million rows, why are you going to display that? Right? So if you've got one website, what are you going to do with 10 million rows in your result set? It makes no sense whatsoever. So this rows column is already an indicator of stupidity. Right? So it correlates highly with, with stupid stuff. You know? So it's, it's sort of a soft uh, hint to stupidity. Second thing is, Cache hit rates, shared, underscore, whatever. It's not the cache hit rate of your server. Because you're waiting, if you click something, you're waiting on a query, not on a server, right? You're waiting on this particular query. So cache hit rates in a global context is pointless. It's really relevant in the context of a query. Because if you have a 100 terabyte database and you have one gigabyte of RAM, and you're running a backup, what kind of cache hit rate do you expect? It's going to be zero, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Right? You cannot cache 100 terabytes of data unless you're Facebook, Google, or something. You know? So cache hit rate is really something which is in the context of a query. Right? It's not overall. What's the best cache hit rate? 100%. Oh, shit, I only got 99.5. You know? So it's really in the context of a query. And finally, temporary I.O. and uh, and the normal AO. But let's move on to the magic. If you only remember one thing, this is it. <laughs> so maybe you can quickly memorize. <laughs> this is literally golden. If you just have this kind of query, forget the substring on top. I'm only going to do that so that it fits on one page. right? So forget the substring. It's not what you want. But this is literally the most important query you can have if you're inspecting your database stuff. So let's wait for the pictures. Everybody? You can have the slides, so it's no problem. And this is what you're going to get. You get the queries, and at the end, you're going to get the percentage points. And I pointed this query to a super intelligent, uh, intelligent blah, person in Germany, and he spotted the insert statement. It said 1%, and he said, I knew it was the insert. <laughs> if you're at this level of expertise, give up. Forget it. <laughs> Hopeless. You know? But what you're going to see here is that there are two queries which cause all the load. And in average, they need one millisecond. So there's not much room for improvement usually, right? If something takes one millisecond, and if it takes half your load, I mean, there's not much you can do. So, so in many cases, it's not the slow queries which cause uh, the issue. So if you look at the copy statement, it's 200 milliseconds. It's by far the slowest one here. But it's not going to do anything because it's the initial import. OK? So you really want to see the queries in comparison to all the rest. And then you can judge from the, the, the average runtime, is it worth looking at this query or not? Because if, we are, if you're already, like the third update, uh, at 0 0.02 milliseconds, there, there's not much you can do, right? And now you've pinpointed the problem. So in this case, if we could eliminate the first update, just because we had better logic in our application, we would have already doubled our speed. No slow query load, uh, log, no load graphs, nothing, right? Just this bloody query and a little bit of analysis. And the answer to the question here is relevance first. What you see here is relevance first. That's important stuff. So now we know what, uh, what is happening here. We can basically, uh, we can basically uh, move forward and move to the most important topic uh, in the world, right?
So I've told you already who paid for my shoes, now I'm going to show you who paid for my jeans. I think it was 12 euros. Uh, forgotten indexes. If you are stupid like hell, right? If you're only able to create proper indexes in Postgres, it's already enough to do a part-time consultancy job. <laughs> if it's the only thing you know is create index, you can already fix 70% of all problems, right? And that's reality. If somebody calls you and says, we got to fix the rate level, optimization, uh, file system, cache, throughput, IO scheduler, kernel parameter, you can already hear one missing index, two missing indexes, three missing indexes. <laughs> it already pies up. Or as somebody on our Slack channel stated recently, real consulting or missing index. <laughs> what was the problem? <laughs> and it's usually missing index. And what are we looking for? If you're reading 10 million rows 10 million times, you're reading many rows. And guess what? Reading many rows is expensive. How could it happen, right? So here is the miracle query. So that's the second query you might want to remember to fix 70% of all problems. What we are looking for is we are looking for the schema, the table. Then we want to see how often did we read a table sequentially, how many rows did we find that Sikta bread, how often did we use an index, and then what we try to figure out is what was the average size of a sequential scan. If we got a sequential scan on provinces, I think you got nine provinces, right? Something like that? I learned it yesterday from the taxi driver. <laughs> so. Uh, if you've got nine provinces, what you're going to get is a sequential scan. There's nothing wrong with a sequential scan. But there is a lot of stuff wrong if you read a 10 billion row table 10 million times. That's going to blow up the system. And you're going to see that in the statistics, right? And this is, the, and this is uh, also very important. Everything that shows up on top here is a candidate for a missing index. What you're going to see is if you order by the number of rows you processed, and if something 10 million times, 10 million rows, it's this number, you know? It's going to do something to your system. And one missing index can blow up your whole thing. So imagine you got 1,000 queries for one millisecond. And then you got one missing index in your queries one second. One bad query is expensive as 1,000 good ones. You have to keep that in mind. So one misplaced missing index can blow up the whole thing, you know? So, Usually, you can see that in PG start statements, uh, and you're going to see pointless operations, right? So let's look at solutions, right? So now I've told you a lot about problems, a lot about other people's stupidity, because we never forget missing indexes, right? Anybody who ever forgot missing index? Hands up. Oh, it's six people out of 200? Cool. <laughs> so let's take a look at, at classical examples where you can really do something I mean, not just missing indexes, that's boring, but let's have gender, <coughs> and let's have male and female, right? Two genders. And then we create a table with people. So we got a serial number, we got a gender, and we got some, some data, right? So we got a gender table with two entries, and we got a person table with five million entries, right? And what we do here is we insert into person, and we just say half of them is male, half of them is female. So we got 2.5 million women, 2.5 million men. We just load, populate the data with 5 million rows. And what we want to do is we want to count how often does each gender show up. Very simple query. Can we speed it up somehow? Any ideas? The answer is, yes, we can, and I'm not showing you how to change parameters, because we all know memory is cool and, and things like that. We really want to understand the problem. And what's going to happen here is that to fix that, we've got to understand how Postgres does aggregation. And if we do it that way, it's not uh, 960 milliseconds anymore, it's only 526, right? So it must be a miracle. So we almost doubled our speed just by rewriting this query a bit. So let's take a look. Instead of joining here, we aggregate 
on the gender ID. So we're not joining anymore and then doing the aggregation, but we're aggregating on the gender ID, right? And then we take this aggregation and then we do the join, right? Did everybody get the concept? I'll elaborate. Must be a miracle, of course it's a miracle, right? Uh, and the answer is in the optimizer. <coughs> Normally, one of the core limitations in Postgres, which has been around for 20 years, and which is super hard to fix, basically, is we got to join first and then do the aggregation. What it means is that we have to look up the gender five million times, right? So we have to really join five million times and then do the operation and, and then do the aggregation on a more expensive data type. Okay? So that's a problem. And this is why it takes 900 milliseconds. If we go for the with statement, so we got millions of lookups, and this is going to cause uh, the deterioration in performance. If we go for this kind of query, where we do the aggregation on the ID first and the lookup later, then we're going to get this kind of plan. So it's first gonna, going to do the aggregation uh, in the common table expression, and then it's going to join on the gender. This is going to speed up stuff. So if you really have a lot of joining and aggregation, it can, not always, but it might make sense to aggregate first and join later. Right? The good news is one of my workmates has been working on a patch for Postgres Optimizer to fix this kind of stuff for, I think, one and a half years. So it's that hard to fix it in the optimizer. Uh, <coughs> basically, to make Postgres do that out of the box. But it's not so easy because the, the data type going into the aggregate function is changing and things like that. So it's, it's a super hard problem. But for now, until this goes into Postgres, hopefully 13, uh, one way to speed up aggregations is to do aggregation first, join later. You have to try it out. It's not always the case, but it could be very beneficial, right? Any questions? Anybody? Well, I'm lost, right? No, you're lost. <laughs> so, second thing is, uh, let's suppose we have 20 years of data, and we're going to check for a period. So this is a classical example of uh, time series data. So we are counting the number of entries for each sensor, and what we got here is one billion rows, right? And we might have speed up this query. And the problem in this case is that we have to select one billion rows out of 20 billion rows. We got to search, right? We got to find them. And the answer to the problem in this case is the observation is we have to find one billion rows out of 20 billion rows. And of course, what you just learned before, we got to create an index, right? <coughs> so the index has to find one billion out of 20 billion. And if you are on traditional hardware, this is going to kill you, right? It's a lot of B-tree operations. It's a lot of searching. And the next thing is that a B-tree is super cool for searching, but it comes with a price tag. And the rule of thumb is that a B-tree entry is roughly 25 bytes. So if we get roughly, right, it depends on fragmentation and stuff like that, but it's roughly 25 bytes. So if you get 25, uh, 20 billion rows, times 25 bytes, this is the price tag for your P-tree. So it's going to need some storage, right? So what you can do here is you can partition by year. One thing you have to keep in mind, partitioning per se is not a miracle. There is no such thing as a, as a miracle that fits all, right? Uh, if you can walk over water, which has happened historically, I think, uh, it's a pretty bad idea if you want to go swimming, right? doesn't work, you know? And the same is with, uh, with Postgres, uh, Postgres features. Uh, in this case, partitioning is, is going to help out with, uh, with, uh, with uh, finding the right partition so that it can avoid searching for the data because you already know it's in this partition, right? <coughs> and one of those features here, you can use as a block range index. And uh, in Postgres, we've got several types of indexes, and one thing to, to fix uh, the, the time series stuff is this block range index. So how does it work? We take a megabyte of data here, megabyte of data here, megabyte of data here, and we calculate the minimum and the maximum. So instead of pointing to everybody, like a B-tree, 
We just calculate the minimum and the maximum and say, okay, we got people from 20 to 40, here we got people from 40 to 60, and here we got people from 50 to 90, right? Not looking at anybody in particular. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, this is what a block range index does. So it, it's sort of index style partitioning, you could say. And the, the advantage here is that this guy is really small. I told you that the P tree is roughly 25 bytes per entry, and this guy is only 48K, right? Very nice. But I told you, it's going to get the minimum of a megabyte of data, minimum and maximum, minimum and maximum, minimum and maximum. And this only works if your data is sort of sorted, right? So you've got ordered data. If data is random, the minimum and the maximum is not going to buy you anything because you've got the global minimum and maximum here, same here, same here. So this really only works on sorted data, but it can be very beneficial for data warehousing, right? And it's usually something like 2,000 times smaller you know, for, for time series. I can show you more in uh, detail. What else can we do? We can do many things at once. So if you want to speed up your database, what you can do is you can do many things at once. And one, a couple of ways to do that is you can go for pre-aggregation. So if you go back to the example at the beginning with 340 billion rows, all the historic data of the company, we can pre-aggregate because 1960 is not going to change anymore. So we can pre-calculate it so that we don't have to do it all over again every day. The next thing is a synchronous six scan. I'm going to show you in a minute. And the third thing is you can use so-called grouping sets and partial aggregates. Let me give you a number. If you got a terabyte of data, and suppose you can read a uh, terabyte of data, and suppose you can read it at one gigabyte per second. It takes 20 minutes to read the data, just to read the data, right? It's 1,000 seconds, and 1,000 seconds is roughly 20 minutes, right? So only reading a terabyte of data at one gigabyte per second is 20 minutes, right? So if you have to read it 10 times, right, it's going to be expensive. So it makes sense to read the data once and use it more often. Because in many cases, the limitation on large amounts of data is I.O. You, you can have a 60-core machine, but you cannot have an I.O. system which is going to give you uh, 100 gigabytes per second, right? I mean, you can, but not easily, you know? Okay? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also doing more than once. And let's add one more column here with age. And let's run something like this. We count everybody, group by gender, and then we filter the young ones, whatever young might be. Anybody 51 here? Oh, bad news. <laughs> okay, so this is a so-called partial aggregate. So basically, if you do this without the filter, it would be free queries, mean, meaning you have to read your terabyte of data three times. But by using more advanced SQL features, you can often uh, get a benefit because you only read once, but you get many, many result sets. And the next interesting thing here, from my point of view, is the roll-up clause. What it means is male, female, total. The roll-up is going to give you the bottom line. If you do this with traditional SQL, it would be six queries, right? Meaning six terabytes of data instead of reading one terabyte of data. So it makes a lot of sense to dig into these modern SQL features because it, in large amounts of data, it's going to help you to read data only once instead of 20 times. Okay? And this is, a, this is something you, you cannot fix with configuration. You can only fix it with uh, logic. The counter argument is, but we use Hibernate. Well, then die gracefully. No problem. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And the next thing is a so-called synchronous six scan, which was on the list before. What does it mean? Suppose we got 10 terabytes of data, and we want to read it all, right? And suppose the first operation, this one, is here, right? So we're reading 100 terabytes of data, and our first operation is somewhere here. 40, 40 terabytes have been read. Suppose a second query comes along. And what Postgres does is, the sequential scan does not start at the beginning. It starts 
where the other one already is. So instead of having one query here and one query here, the second query hooks in here so that they go through the table at the same time. So we read the data once and use it more often. And then the second sequential scan is going to do the rest as soon as we're done. So Postgres basically tries to synchronize sequential scans if they are expensive enough. Right? And what this means is that if you're running 10 queries on identical data, so let's say 10 billion rows of measurement data, start them concurrently, not sequentially. Because you read the data once, but you use it 10 times for 10 queries at the same time, right? So this is a synchronized six scan, which is super useful for, for data warehousing. So bottom line is, do more at the same time and uh, use modern SQL. So to wrap it up, first thing, measure. Don't rely on something coming to you naturally. Measure, find the top queries, because high load is always related to, uh, to queries. It's never related to cache hit rate or whatever. That's the consequence, right? So always find the queries first. Second thing is check for missing indexes. Third thing is use more advanced SQL. Uh, use uh, too many things at once, right? And understand what you're doing, right? That's the most important thing. So I made it in time. Thank you for your attention. I hope you liked the presentation. And uh, you can catch me outside. So follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, share the news. And have a great conference. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody, any questions? Yeah, if anybody has, to, yeah. Uh, um, I the yes. Oh, forever, 10 years maybe. So when have synchronized six scans been introduced? It was at least 10 years ago. So synchronized six scans at least 10 years ago. I don't remember which one. It has been around for forever and a day, right? Any more questions? So if anybody has taken pictures, uh, feel free to send it to me so we can Twitter the hell out of it. And uh, yeah, have a nice conference. Thank you.